Welcome to our second round table in our short series on China after COVID. Last time we discussed about the uh, internal dynamics that are shaping the Chinese economy uh, these days. And today we will discuss about the new rules of engagement that China has um, started to address since 2020 and even more so in 2021. These days show that traditional high-level diplomacy seems to be stuck in a confrontational mode that seems to bring nowhere. And uh, we saw that tones were bitter at the US-China summit last uh, weekend in Alaska. And um, yesterday, also EU-China relations uh, actually turned rather uh, Chile is surely much more than last year and for sure uh, of last December. Um, uh, you, China, actually raised the sanctions vis-a-vis uh, -vis one another, so times are very difficult for a dialogue between, uh, for sure, US and China, but also between EU and, uh, and China. And uh, last but not least, yesterday, um, Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov in China actually suggested that the two nations should uh, join efforts uh, to become independent from the West, both uh, technologically and financially. So all of this happens um, in a time where actually China is very active uh, on uh, very different types of diplomatic efforts. Uh, so let me call them second tier or second level diplomacy. And one of these is digital uh, regulatory diplomacy or the digital Silk Road as a pillar of the broader Belt and Road. And the second is the uh, Health Silk Road, uh, which has also been called the vaccine diplomacy. So it, it seems that China is very active in building a broad area of influence that will shape the future of international relations. And the aim of China seems to be uh, that of securing a broad area of influence uh, for the future. So uh, this is the topic today. We will discuss it with uh, three very um, knowledgeable speakers on the issues. Uh, first, uh, Tyson Barker, Head of Technology and Global Affairs Program at the German Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, welcome, Tyson. Thanks for joining us today. And um, second, uh, Yukon Huang, Senior Fellow at the Asia Program at Carnegie from the US. Thank, thank you for joining us. And last but not least, Eduardo Missoni, currently Professor of Global Health uh, and many other issues related to health at the um, Postgraduate School of uh, Management at Bocconi University, but with a very rich CV um, in international issues related to health and development. So uh, thank you, Eduardo, for joining us today. So um, there is a lot of food for thought, uh, especially after the weekend and after uh, yesterday, as I mentioned. So. We are, in a sense, very lucky to discuss these issues today. And, um, and if you agree, I would like to give the floor first to Yukon Huang, because um, from your research, um, uh, it's uh, on the re US-China relations and following up on the very lively and actually ongoing debate about the decoupling between the US and China and the consequences on the rest of the world. It seems that we are um, in a very, you know, troubled time about this. And I would ask you, where do we stand on US-China uh, US relations? And where does the debate stand? I mean, is there any convergence or divergence between the facts, as we saw maybe uh, an example last weekend, and the narrative about the decoupling 
Um, can you tell us a bit, a little bit, where do we stand in in, in this debate? Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be addressing this audience. Uh, let's take a little bit of a historical perspective. Uh, when President Trump several years ago launched the so-called trade war, he focused largely upon trade, trade deficits. He put tariffs in place against uh, European products, uh, Chinese products, uh, products from other countries. Uh, this was very quickly followed by concerns of the business community. They were concerned about unfair investment practices in China, uh, their ability to access the domestic market, uh, protection of intellectual property rights. And then gradually over the last year, I would say that the foreign policy security establishment began to express their views. And there they were concerned about China's rise as a major innovative technological power, the conflict between two great powers, and then the decoupling process really began so first, the United States started to put restrictions on exports of high-tech products to China. And over 300 Chinese companies today no longer have flexible access to a whole range of products produced in the United States. This was extended to the financial markets. So many Chinese companies no longer can list on U.S. foreign exchanges. There is a clampdown on the flow of exchange in terms of research collaboration among academics, visa restrictions. Uh, there is even a curtailment of the media presence in the U.S. and in China. So you have a whole range of what I would call decoupling measures from products to academic exchanges uh, to even visa exchanges and counselor representation in two countries. Now, what has been the response? Uh, on China's side, they put in place reciprocal laws uh, to also be able to restrict products, but they don't have that many products that America needs. So what's been happening is a dramatic decline in U.S. foreign investment in China. China, in its uh, last uh, party Congress meetings a month ago, put forward its 14th five-year plan, and there are two major themes in the 14th five-year plan. One is that in terms of the external environment, in the view of the decoupling, it wants to be more independent. It's starting to uh, increase its investment in strategic industries with the view of being self-sufficient in many of these high-tech products, particularly semiconductors, over the next five to ten years. Domestically, China is also trying to rely more upon domestic consumption investment to grow and less on foreign investment and trade if that becomes a difficult or more hostile, hostile environment. But it's also important to realize that during the pandemic, China is the only major economy that experienced positive growth last year, of around 2.5%. And you have declines in GDP ranging from 3% in the U.S. to anywhere between 4 to 8% in Europe. China's share of global trade over the last year soared uh, much faster than any other country that we've seen in, in history. So in some sense, the perception that supply chains are being disrupted, that China's ability to trade is being impede, impeded, has not been borne by the reality because China was able to ratchet up medical product exports, uh, exports of electronics, and a whole range of industrial products because it basically recovered from the pandemic faster than anyone else. So now you have a situation of China trying to go much faster in terms of developing a domestic capacity in high tech products, its export industrial production remains quite strong. It feels relatively self-confident. And in that situation, you have a new administration in the United States. So what Biden is basically trying to focus on, he wants to move away from what I call the chaotic decoupling of the Trump years to a much more measured response. He wants to form alliances to deal with China. He wants to strengthen America's domestic ability to compete. He's focusing much more upon workers rather than consumers in terms of trade negotiations. But we have to realize that the Democrats, just like the Republicans, have very strong negative uh, views of China. Approximately 70% of the American public have, have unfavorable views of China. And this is reflected in the Alaska meetings where the U.S. side expressed extreme displeasure on China's policies 
ranging from human rights uh, to security concerns in the South China Sea to what's going on in Hong Kong, what's going on in the Xinjiang, uh, Xinjiang restriction of the Uy Uyghurs. So there are a whole range of concerns from foreign policy, human rights, to trade, and to investment. And from the Chinese side, there are also very strong accusations Sorry, Yukong, we cannot hear you well. If the problem, okay, so um, just give me a couple of seconds to see if we can have you come back to complete this presentation or if you have to move on. No, apparently I cannot hear him. So the, the point is, and then we will go back to this, um, whether to sum a little bit up, um, despite everybody talking about the huge costs of decoupling between the US and China, actually we see no effort from either side to move on, I mean, constructively, as we s would say. Um, so despite the, the, the fact that the consequences would be enormous for China, maybe more for the US, who knows, or for Europe as well, for the rest of the world, uh, everybody is looking at um, actions on both sides to see whether the scenario would be more towards uh, uh, northerly decoupling or uh, or something different uh, and we still this is a very open issue uh, so we we'll go back to Yukon afterwards uh, but then as uh, I was saying before these days you know embassies may be you know not very willing to move forward but actually other levels of diplomatic efforts are very fast and one of these is the digital Silk Road uh, as uh, China has called uh, one of the pillars of the Belt and Road Actually, um, Tyson Barker will also maybe have a word on whether it's, a, I mean, officially a pillar of Belt and Road or it's a parallel uh, project uh, or, or program, but this is, I mean, not very relevant. What uh, matters is that uh, this is a, a kind of a new type of diplomacy that actually is very active and tries to build new borders, new areas of influence through digital technology. So Tyson, would you, uh, would you please um, uh, uh, summarize a little bit what in your research you are researching on this very specifically. So would you please you know, try to make us understand what the DSR, the digital sync road is, and uh, whether it's a new form of diplomacy that actually impacts on the field very much and even more than what uh, you know traditional diplomacy is heading these days. Tyson, the floor is yours. Uh, first of all, for, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, first of all, thanks to uh, ISPI for the invitation to be here and from the Italian Foreign Ministry, this is a real pleasure. Um, we are clearly in a very sensitive time, and as you mentioned, there have been uh, sanctions, counter sanctions announced by the Chinese government on uh, some of our think tank counterparts here in Europe, including Marix here in Berlin uh, and the Alliance of Democracies, which also has a presence in Berlin, although it's based in Denmark. And I just want to say that both of these are highly respected organizations that really contribute to the discussion and debate. Uh, on China and European China relations, uh, and that their work is really valued here in Berlin and, and is very, very influential. So I just wanted to, to make that note at the top. Um, on the digital Silk Road, um, I think that some of the points that were brought up uh, lead very well into this because clearly China recognizes technology and technological leadership as a key vector in a geopolitical leadership. Um, and I'd like to start with a quote from uh, Xi Jinping from 2016, which I think actually plays into what was just said, which is, and this is from him, uh, our dependence on core technology 
is a hidden trouble for us. Therefore, having a good command of core technology is our mission. Heavy dependence on imported core technology is like building our house on top of someone else's walls. No matter how big and beautiful it is, it won't remain standing during the storm. And I think that that is a great encapsulation of how China thinks about technology and conceives of its kind of, let's say, digital grand strategy, if you will, um, starting from a point of kind of domestic development of technology, import, uh, substitution, industrialization around ICT, and then moving into the global tech race, recognizing that technology itself is a key vector for exporting a type of ideology. Um, two points that I would flag kind of central to this are the idea, and that was mentioned, that China wants to uncoil from uh, external dependencies and create its own asymmetric dependencies from others. And I think that that is one area where the digital Silk Road actually plays a very important role. Um, another point that was mentioned because we are having this discussion in the context of the COVID crisis is this confidence that China has, borne out from uh, growth, increased demand, uh, a sense of vindication at the resilience of the, the Chinese economy during this crisis, especially as compared to uh, the United States and Europe, for example. Um, I wanted to initially start with some of the domestic origins of Chinese tech development, but I'm gonna go ahead and skip that and move directly into where the digital Silk Road plays in the BRI and how it's developed, let's say, over the past year and a half or so. So initially, you know, China did have this kind of policy of uh, being rather protectionist, trying to have this import substitution industrialization model, uh, creating intermediation relationships between states and companies, um, trying to set autarkic standards at home with the logic of social harmony and complete control that was linked to the Chinese Communist Party and to the government. Um, once there was confidence in the um, quality and price of a lot of Chinese tech, tech equipment, uh, they started a process of exporting that over capacity, trying to create market share, and slowly along the digital silk, or excuse me, slowly along the um, Belt and Road, where initially most of the projects were kind of classical infrastructure projects, capital intensive, labor intensive, uh, creation of ports, creation of roads, rail, etc. Uh, we saw a move into more ICT infrastructure. Uh, and as that became more successful, uh, this ICT overlay, which was initially kind of a plug-in for the BRI, became much more central to the BRI. Um, and this idea of con connectivity infrastructure is, is really key to a lot of the, um, let's say, logic of, of the Digital Silk Road in the years prior to, uh, to, the, to the COVID crisis. Again, cheap equipment due to subsidies and overcapacity, um, a, a, a tie, a fusion with diplomacy because the government is backing a lot of these efforts. Um, and a desire to create infrastructure at every level of the stack. So undersea cables, 5G mobile equipment, uh, satellites, et cetera. And then also offerings, um, connectivity offerings along other infrastructure, rail ports, uh, smart cities, uh, safe cities, um, use of AI infused surveillance, uh, creating infrastructure that will at some point make IoT much more uh, prevalent in, in developing cities and urban environments. So uh, what is, how does the Silk Road relate to the, uh, to the Belt and Road Initiative and how does it differ? Well, again, we, as I just mentioned, this is about going from import substitution industrialization to internationalization, that's the first. The second is, and this has changed over the, the course of the COVID crisis, but initially it was less politically sensitive uh, in a lot of countries that were using uh, these, this type of equipment because you couldn't see the workers. A lot of times China uses its own workers, uh, uses its own um, um, suppliers, etc. Uh, in these capital intensive uh, infrastructure projects along the Belt Road. And because it was less politically sensitive and in some ways more effective, uh, it became a much more central element of the BRI. 
Third is flexibility. Um, unlike uh, the BRI in, in itself, which is very much focused on, again, these heavy, heavy infrastructure projects, a lot of government relations, uh, you have a federated relationship. So you get broad kind of mission, broad mandate, guidelines and guardrails from, from the government. But a lot of companies, small and medium sized enterprises, Chinese big tech, uh, SMEs, etc., are doing smaller projects, niche projects in, in third countries. And the fourth is, of course, the, the importance of standard setting, uh, both in the sense that China has made a real diplomatic push to build capacity in standard setting organizations like the ITU and ISO, but also the idea that by exporting uh, technical standards and internet governance models, they are somewhat reinforced by the fact that on the ground adoption creates path dependencies in user behavior. So those are some of the elements of the digital Silk Road pre-COVID. What has changed from the COVID crisis? Um, I would say that there are four accelerations that have taken place. The first was mentioned. It's an acceleration in US-China tensions, decoupling, uh, more lists, uh, more uh, companies added to the entities lists, more restrictions on IP, et cetera. Uh, that I think everybody is aware of. The second has been an acceleration in tech adoption globally. Uh, so we've seen not only a lot more use of digital services, as we are doing right now, where we wouldn't have been doing this a year and a half ago, uh, but also a lot of upgrades in consumer-facing or user-facing hardware and IoT. So, for example, massive uh, purchases in laptops and smartphones, uh, new purchases in cars, etc. Demand increases in this, this upgrade of IoT, which is now part of the, the tech stack. The third is an acceleration in the deterioration of physical positions in middle and low income countries. So there's less of an ability to service debt in large BRI projects. And that has had a cascading and somewhat mixed effect on some areas of the ICT components. So some states have increased uh, during the crisis uh, investment in say 5G uh, mobile equipment like uh, in the Middle East, but a lot of states are having trouble continuing with these kinds of projects. And the fourth is, I would call, an accelerated coupling of the European and Chinese economies led by Germany. Because of the increased demand, because of Chinese growth in the fourth quarter, 6% growth, uh, you have seen auto, heavy machinery, manufacturing companies in Germany much more reliant on Chinese demand and Chinese production, where they have, their, where they have production facilities, uh, to, to basically as a lifeline for the German and European economy. So what does this mean for uh, the digital Silk Road uh, in times of COVID? Well, I would flag four just broad uh, changes or permutations that, that I think are characterize what has happened over the past year. The first is a move beyond hardware towards use of digital services, Chinese digital services outside of China, digital health and fintech. Um, and I know we're going to talk a little bit about digital health in a second, so I'll just focus on digital services. Um, Chinese e-commerce has increased its market share globally, uh, including in Europe. Many countries in Europe have AliExpress as the second largest e-commerce platform. And of course, we know about TikTok and, and other uh, large and even smaller and medium-sized uh, digital services provisions coming out of China. The second is, of course, the use of digital payments which China has pioneered and the adoption rate is very large. Um, and that is starting to set the stage for an export model where digital payments are linked to the e yuan, perhaps digital currency. And we're gonna see a much broader stack of services uh, linked into, uh, for example, Chinese uh, e-commerce, digital services, et cetera. The second is uh, moving beyond tech transfer to investments and acquisitions. Um, again, looking at big Chinese technology companies like Alibaba and Tencent, there's a real push to diversify, a push to create market share, uh, a push to uh, create, gain market access and know-how, and also, especially given the political climate, to uh, gain some legitimacy in home markets, uh, a little bit of reputation laundering with local associations. 
So with Alibaba, you see a lot of acquisitions of e-commerce, major e-commerce platforms in places like Indonesia, Malaysia, Myanmar, Singapore. Uh, you see acquisitions of data centers in places like South Korea and the UK. And of course, for us in Europe, with Tencent, you see a lot of acquisitions of gaming companies, which are actually very important uh, incubators for general purpose technologies like artificial intelligence. Uh, the third beyond, I would say, is moving beyond the outbound digital Silk Road to a reverse flow digital Silk Road, um, where you're seeing increase, which was mentioned, increased consumption at home, increased investment in uh, infrastructure at home, including uh, the Chinese government's goal, I don't know if they reached it, of deploying 550,000 5G base stations last year. Um, and more sophistication in how they interpret this kind of dual circulation model. So even if you look at something like the logic of the comprehensive investment agreement, which the European Union and China concluded in December, um, it allows for more investment from foreign companies into, for example, data centers, um, which pulls a lot of these companies, and some of them have actually named this explicitly, like Siemens and Daimler, into the Chinese ecosystem to actually participate in the Digital Silk Road in the midterm. And they both actually said, we want to be participants in the Digital Silk Road as part of this ecosystem in the future. And the fourth beyond that I would flag that has occurred uh, during the crisis is moving beyond standard setting to regulatory mirroring and global governance. Um, obviously, standard setting capacity is a new front line in geopolitical competition. Um, but China has also made a real effort to mirror the kind of discourse you see around data protection and privacy, around antitrust, around blocking statutes, uh, as it has occurred in Europe but never necessarily with the same intent at home. Um, and at the same time, not only have they been trying to build capacity within standard setting organizations, but also repatriating some of the international organizations capacities back home. And the two examples that I would name are the United Nations decision to locate two data centers in China, two UN data centers in China, one on geospatial information and one on big data. And of course, that will have a legitimizing effect as uh, countries consider whether or not to cooperate with China in, in data projects. And these, these two centers are, of course, um, could become hubs for uh, Chinese access to, to global data. Um, and with that, I will stop and look forward to the questions. Thank you, Tyson. So uh, it seems that China with the Digital Silk Road is building new avenues for coupling with parts of the world, Africa, Southeast Asia, East Asia, Europe, Central Asia, and whoever. Um, so this gives me the chance to go back to Yukong. Sorry about uh, the troubles in connection, Yukong. You were interrupted, so I will give you the floor again to complete your, your, um, your argument. So which is the sentiment these days in the US? Still going on an orderly, not disorderly like before in the Trump's years, uh, decoupling or more orderly decoupling? Uh, is it feasible? Is it viable? Is it something that uh, is uh, really in the intention, in the spirit of the US administration with Biden or what? Please. Well, let me just uh, uh, go over some of the key points uh, at the risk of perhaps duplicating uh, some things I said uh, that uh, was not garbled in the audio. Uh, Biden wants to uh, continue, I, I think, in terms of the many of the same sentiments that Trump had in terms of concerns about China's uh, progress as a major technological power. But I would call Trump's policies as chaotic, unpredictable, uh, event-focused, and Biden is trying to make it much more strategic. But both face a very negative sentiments from the U.S. public. 70% uh, of the U.S. public, whether Democrats or Republicans, they're very anti-China. So this decoupling, this decoupling pressure is pretty strong, pervasive. So Biden has laid out a strategy uh, focusing on improving America's competitiveness, a focus on workers rather than consumers, downplaying what I would call trade agreements, 
but a willingness to work with alliances, particularly Europe and Asia, to address what I call the key concerns that are driving global tensions in investment. And here we're talking about technology transfer policies. So we have here in the United States an entity list which has about 300 Chinese companies uh, not able to import high-tech products easily. We have financial restrictions which say that U.S. financial companies cannot invest or channel the funds into China. We have restrictions on academic controls and research collaborations. But even with these restrictions, we should realize that trade flows between U.S. and China surged in the last four or five or six months because of the pandemic. Our U.S. demand for Chinese products has is, is soared, whether it's medical equipment, electronics, industrial products. Financial money is still flowing into China in large amounts, and it's because the RMB, uh, the exchange rates, the interest rates are a bit higher. It's a growing economy. It's likely to grow at eight or nine percent this coming year, so that's going to attract a lot of flows. So there's concerns about supply chain links, decoupling. It may be a bit exaggerated because the markets are driving. Markets drive uh, the flow of goods and services, not so much government policies. So that's one thing I wanted to mention. From a Chinese side, they're concerned about whether they can work with the Biden administration. As you mentioned, the meeting in Alaska was very tense. Both sides are sending strong messages. China's repeating this concern about Western pressures on so-called core issues. Core issues being Taiwan, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, South China Sea. Uh, China is trying to become much more independent in high-tech product lines. So it's got seven or eight strategic sectors where they're pouring in lots of monies, of which semiconductors is the key. So a big issue in the future is can China become relatively self-sufficient in producing what I call the more advanced semiconductors. China currently imports about 80% of the semiconductors it needs. So it's shooting to basically be able to produce maybe something like half, but that's going to be a problematic. Someone would estimate that it may take five to eight years or 10 years for China to be competitive in the West. Right now, the capacity, the capacity to produce semiconductors, largely in the US, South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, a few other places, and China is basically way far, way, pretty far behind. So for China's concern, the West, can they strike what I call deals? And of course, the major one was the investment treaty with Europe, but that requires, as you all know, parliamentary ratification. It's highly, uh, uh, perhaps is very uncertain. China struck a major uh, trade deal within Asia, ARCEP, and that, that is basically 10 countries, including ASEAN. China's interested in joining in the so-called revised TPP, uh, which binds Japan uh, and a bunch of other countries in a more high-end uh, trade agreement. The U.S. is not uh, physically, not, pr uh, not uh, present in terms of trade deals. It's not a member of RCEP. It's unlikely to join the TPP. It's interested in having a voice in what I call standards and regulations in Asia, but there's no convenient way for it to actually get involved. So I think this will also be a, a form of contention. When Biden talks about alliances, he's going to face the issue that Europe is very much similar in terms of many ideological views toward China, but its economic links with China are much greater than America's. European investment in China is about twice as large as American investment. Europe's involvement in manufacturing in China, again, is much greater than America's involvement in manufacturing. Germany's integration into the Chinese economy is very, very extensive. If you look at Asia, 20 to 30 percent of the foreign investment of Japan, South Korea, other countries goes to China. Only one to two percent of U.S. investment goes to China. So contrary to a belief that America is heavily invested in China, over the last 10 years, American foreign investment in China has been almost negligible. So the links between Asian economies and European economies in China is much stronger than U.S. investment in China. So when you talk about decoupling, 
and trade tensions in the future. And the U.S. trying to build alliances, whether it's with Europe or Asia, uh, one has to realize that the economic implications are much more important for Europe and Asia in some ways than they are for the United States. Let me stop here. Thank you, Yukong. Um, so maybe we go back to whether um, uh, one might agree with those who think that two growth poles are actually emerging, one in the Pacific uh, without the US and one uh, led by the US still, but you know, uh, very or rather disconnected from, from the first one. So this is a very open issue. Uh, thank you again. So now we move to Professor Missoni on the Elf Silk Road. Uh, of course, Eduardo, nobody wants to talk about uh, viruses and uh, vaccines. We want to get it, but we want to, want to talk about it. But still, this is a very, very relevant channel of diplomacy. We see nowadays uh, China is competing on vaccine uh, offers and um, experts to a lot of developing countries. You are very knowledgeable on this as well. So uh, how do you see that? Uh, how, how far is the Helsinki Road building bridges between China uh, and very weak or poor or you know, passive developing economies and how this may actually impact on other levels of diplomatic action uh, by China. Thank you, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me make a little bit of a historical context too. I mean, if we go back to the year 2000, so at the beginning of the century, uh, China was a recipient of international aid, including in health. And uh, if we move one decade, 10 years ago, with my group, we were studying about the BRIC, so the emerging economies, where China was one of those, uh, an, important, uh, an important net provider of aid, but still were, we were looking at it as part of a group. Uh, we admit it was such a group. Indeed, um, it is dissolved totally. We know Brazil with its own crisis, South Africa on the other side, uh, Russia with its own policy. But in the 2010, 2011, they were working together, including ministers of health would come together, try to establish a common alternative policy in global health to other. They would have some common positions in WHO, for example. That's gone. That's gone. Out, out of that group, China now emerged. Russia has its own story, obviously. Uh, emerged now as a individual subject, so the group we cannot speak anymore of the BRICS as such. Uh, today and in all these years, uh, China has made big, big investments in uh, uh, low-income countries, um, especially in Africa, but not only in Africa. And I would agree with uh, with Tyson uh, that they were making big investments mainly in infrastructure. They have been building hospitals. For them, uh, health was building hospitals and eventually deploying health workforce, uh, which is the old way of uh, development assistance. We have experienced this in the past also uh, with uh, European assistance. Uh, so, and a highly uh, tied aid, which we have abandoned in the West. The OECD has condemned this approach uh, in terms of aid effectiveness. Now, uh, an element is important to understand the rest to then go into the vaccine diplomacy is that uh, in 2003, when the first uh, pandemic uh, and, and the potentially enormous uh, harmful pandemic came up with the SARS we call it now SARS-1, uh, China was very um, careful in giving information, has been accused of, of really restricting all the information, not allowing, for example, uh, investing in Taiwan, diplomatic issues there. Uh, the show had really to have a, a long diplomatic in, in terms with the um, uh, Popular Republic of China in order to uh, to some request in Taiwan that, as you know, China is considering its own province. On the other side, Taiwan would like to be in the international, including international 
health community uh, as an independent country with independent needs and also independent competence, I must say. So uh, this uh, uh, reputational damage that uh, China suffered in 2003 now kind of repeated the history in with the with the with the current pandemic where uh, china knew this had the memory of this uh, uh, reputational problem and the, to do i would say the best i mean as ob external observer we cannot totally condemn uh, china in the way it it uh, acted toward a, a new situation that uh, nobody was prepared we have seen it and we still see it nobody ne nowhere uh, countries were were prepared uh, anyway yes if we want we can say that there were some delays in providing the information uh, if we want to especially highlight those things as it has been done in diplomatic terms or in in international relations term as we have seen for example that Trump administration has put the finger on 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 the on the faults or on the limitations in communication, and uh, uh, we know. I mean, it is of public domain uh, the how this has been built on. So China uh, had, was the first to have to face the pandemic practically alone. Uh, nobody would think that the pandemic would leave China to to spread around the world as we are observing now after one year practically all the world there is no non-affected non country but uh, uh, somehow china was able to to face the challenge and then took the advantage of uh, um, and here we we come into into the, the health silk road and and the mechanism with the with the vaccine diplomacy because china was aware of this reputed reputational uh, challenge that it had since the past and uh, i must also say that during the years for example with the with the belt road initiative uh, uh, which already included a number of of health issues um, china was already preparing a health diplomacy it is not new it's not just the vaccine diplomacy the vaccine diplomacy follows a process of increasing we we'll call it health diplomacy which means using the health issues and the uh, the relations in the, the health governance, if we want to uh, gain more space, especially to Africa and other low income countries with which it has provided a really uh, important um, amount of um, assistance in health increasing. And uh, so a number of issues were already included in the Belt Road initiative. Uh, including, uh, um, for example, the promotion of traditional uh, Chinese medicine, for example, but uh, also the, the emergency preparedness. Uh, and uh, so, let's say, very much going into the soft power rather than just the infrastructure of building hospitals. When the, and, and they already, for example, 2017, they already made an agreement with WHO with its foundation so it was really china was already looking forward uh, toward establishing through health diplomacy uh, good relations uh, both in the bilateral area as well as in the multilateral area so when now covid came and uh, and after the first phase where they had to face the emergency then they found them in a certain sense in, a, in, a, in advance in uh, with their uh, already existing presence in many of these countries and they started first what has been called the mask diplomacy uh it is interesting here i can tell it as an anecdote uh, when china was facing the crisis uh, from italy we were sending a, uh, a solidarity measure uh, face masks to china which were made in Wuhan and that be in first imported from uh, from china remaining uh, uh, then having the problem of missing the mask so china would through the mask diplomacy would then send back masks uh, millions of masks uh, uh, to to european countries including italy and this was the first phase of this uh, modified if you want health uh, diplomacy with the vaccine story, as China started immediately to, to work as all the rest of the international community of vaccine. And uh, there are at least uh, four vaccines which are 
in, in the race, uh, they are three in phase three, which means in advanced uh, clinical um, testing. And many of these are already deployed in something like 23, 28 countries. I mean, just uh, the news of yesterday was, or two days ago, that China deployed 400,000 doses of uh, vaccine to uh, Niger uh, with Sinopharm, one of the of the four uh, Chinese vaccines. But China has had the capacity now to take advantage of the, uh, the, 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 the struggling that we are facing in Europe and in the United States, the diplomatic uh, struggle around vaccines. You know what has been called the vaccine nationalism. Um, America's, uh, uh, America's first. Uh, the European also uh, still discussing if they can have a European strategy or every single country going its own way uh, in, uh, um, in uh, procuring vaccines, in, in producing vaccines, and eventually blocking on the vaccines on on this uh, um, impeding uh, export. So while this is happening in the West, uh, China is taking uh, its vaccine diplomacy toward the countries where it already had established very good logistic basis through those investments that came with the Belt Road Initiative and through the past experience in the collaboration with those countries. So uh, taking advantage of its presence um, in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia, and now expanding also to the Arab countries with agreements to test first the, the Chinese uh, to get the possibility to these countries uh, to adopt the vaccine. And so, uh, in, indeed, millions of doses uh, transferred. So, this is the situation how China is really taking the advantage. Now, there is a, I want to make just a, a, a parenthesis, then we may come back to this uh, if you if you like. Um, the relation between China and WHO in high in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the media, especially because uh, the Trump administration, Trump himself was accusing China of being the cause of this Chinese, Chinese epidemic, uh, this Chinese virus, and uh, including you. Uh, this argument, um, the U.S. left uh, the World Health Organization for coming back now uh, uh, with Biden already announced, and it's already the process for the U.S. to come back into the World Health Organization. And um, the accusation was that the WHO was establishing a, um, a previous link with, with China. And actually, uh, WHO as a political institution had actually to manage with all the different doctors. But just to an idea, and it was uh, 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 Trump was was in, in the right. The, the American contribution to the WHO is much higher than the, than the than the the Chinese one in 2020, including with the fact that the U.S. suspended their support to WHO. Um, U.S., which has not been the first donor anymore. I mean, the first dawn of WHO, and this is very a dramatic issue, is the Gates Foundation, um, followed by Germany and the UK, and only the US only provided 7.3% uh, of um, uh, specified voluntary contribution, which are the contributions which really define uh, the strategy uh, on top of the assessed contribution. And China's um, voluntary contribution in 2020, where they also made a special effort, but only where 0.88% of the specified contribution to WHO. So China makes a soft power diplomacy toward the multilateral health environment and is working much more on the bilateral uh, toward, uh, toward countries. However, they, in their, in their discourse, uh, they want to, to, to build this, uh, as they call it, the, the global community uh, of common destiny. Uh, they are want to be more involved in global health, and the vaccine just open a door, but it obviously will go much farther. We were speaking before of the digital Silk Road, and obviously after the pandemic, all the digital health uh, uh, area uh, will uh, may become very very important uh, for the providing uh, you know distance services, distance health services, and uh, and somehow. 
uh, these uh, two. Uh, it is good that we are together here because indeed the, the digital dimension may become a, an important part of the uh, of the hardware uh, of the uh, of China strategy toward uh, these countries. So. This, I don't know, maybe, and we can maybe go more in depth with uh, some questions uh, to see if what are the more details that we may need to, to further discuss on this issue. Thank you, thank you, Eduardo, for stressing and reminding, also Tyson did before, uh, that actually both the digital uh, so-called Silk Road and the Health Belt and Road were there much ahead of 2020. I remember when in Beijing at the first Belt and Road Forum in 2017, uh, the, the memorandum between WHO and China on the Health Belt and Road was signed in a very high level panel uh, in Beijing there. So um, very much ahead of times because already the willingness uh, by on the part of China to cooperate in the health sector, may, mainly in Africa, that was the major, you know, aim of China with a lot of economic interest in, uh, and energy interest in, in Africa, was very uh, much interested in securing also the health part, uh, not only the, um, the economic part. So I remember, and also the digital, I remember when starting to study the, the Chinese expansion in, in the world in terms of investment um, from being a receiver to being an investor abroad. ICT was one of the major sector actually uh, gathering investment in Africa uh, back since 2003 and nobody believed that actually ICT was one of the sectors but it was and now we go back to the data and we see that it was and uh, now we see the picture already in place in a sense so um, but these these days or oh, both digital and health and maybe together as Eduardo was suggesting now are you know revitalized by the pandemic um, and they are paving their ways you know across uh, lands and seas uh, very far um, away from China to build um, what is actually becoming either and here we have no answer but just a big question um, from your research I, it's going to be either a kind of a hub and spoke network model of interaction say China vis-a-vis each of the partners or a more say regional multilateral setting which everybody hopes but uh, for but actually um, now lacks maybe the coalitions that and also the fora were to discuss together uh, so we have a lot of questions but not time anymore but anyway uh, um, I just sum them all up a little bit. Um, uh, do you see more, you know, uh, in the near future, um, not distant future, too difficult, but in the near future, do you see more uh, chances to have um, a more, say, hub and spoke model or more not multilateral because it's too difficult these days, but you know, club type of um, international relations, say s small clubs, uh, not a G2, not a G3, not a G7, maybe a G20. Is the G20 maybe a forum where some of these issues can be tackled? Uh, is there any, any other a place where a significant group of countries can sit down and uh, start talking, if not discussing these issues. I mean, digital regulation, health cooperation, along which lines? Uh, how do you see that? Yukong, you want to start first? We are very you know, interested in understanding which are the sentiment, if not the positions of the US uh, on these issues? Well, China engages with other countries 
and particular groupings depending upon the issue. So you have annual consultations with Europe and China, Africa and China, and then within Asia, you have APEC, uh, broad meetings of ASEAN, um, and you have bilateral meetings as appropriate. The problem we have today is in terms of trade and investment, uh, security issues have become just as important or more important than the commercial and economic concerns. In the past, we used to separate them. Uh, foreign policy, security concerns, you talk about it in this way. Economic and trade, you talk about it in a different way. And they made it a lot easier to think about the groupings. We don't have a natural arrangement to talk about security risks and economic risks. And that's why we have what I call zero sum kind of negotiations. I think the G20 is an appropriate vehicle for reaching an understanding that we need some kind of a global rules for talking about security and economic issues and some kind of regulatory uh, process for governing that discussion. Uh, and it has to go beyond a bilateral relationship between US and China or China and Europe or China and Asia. So you need something which is broader and we don't have that. And I think that is a, the major challenge for everybody in the coming years. Let me just stop there. Uh, back to you, Tyson. Do you see uh, an extended group like the G20, I mean, viable to start these issues, at least, you know, theme by theme? And on your specific digital regulatory issue, do you see avenues for some result? I mean, I think like, like in many areas, um, uh, tech regulation convergence is moving more to ad hoc groupings and uh, formulations or constellations that are less necessarily institutionalized. Obviously, the G20 is a great uh, format to look for baseline uh, agreement uh, between a very divergent group of states with very divergent forms of governance. Um, and they have agreed to, uh, you know, some very low baseline principles, for example, on artificial intelligence. Um, but if you look for that next step to really operationalize, uh, you know, principles in the form of uh, uh, norms and standards, um, probably ad hoc constellations around like-minded countries like you see in the uh, OECD, for example, also even the G7+, plus. Um, the new work of this um, global partnership on artificial intelligence, for example, and then cooperation, public-private cooperation in bodies like uh, the International Standards Organization are probably where you're going to see that at most. The other thing we have to say is standards and governance, and ICT standards are a form of governance, are a lot of times driven by the private sector and driven by adoption. <laughs> so there are just governments that are driving this process. It's also uh, who is making the products and who's buying those products and using them or those services. So I think that those are uh, things that need to be taken into account. Um, the European Union, uh, Tony Blinken is right now in Brussels having conversations today with the European Union and NATO. And I think one of the topics that's going to come up is this uh, EU-US Trade and Technology Council. Uh, where the issue of regulatory convergence is going to be high on the list. The, another issue that's going to be high on the list, or two issues, is going to be market access. So questions around uh, investment screening, export controls, but also import controls, where Europe is very divergent from the United States. Um, and, of course, industrial policy, because both the U.S., Europe, and China are all looking at how they can create independent innovation industrial bases uh, that give them some uh, capacity to act on the global stage in, in emerging technologies. One was mentioned with semiconductors. Europe also has a 10-year plan uh, for greater uh, independence in semiconductors. Um, so those are going to be part of that conversation. But it's going to be, it's not, there's not a one-size-fits-all. Thank you, Tyson. Uh, last word. Uh, very, very short comment. Eduardo, do you see vaccines as building bridges or walls? 
So uh, China, I think, has a sincere interest in using vaccines uh, in building uh, bridges, including in the multilateral area. Uh, China is involved in COVAX, you, you know, the facility that WHO has put on in order to ensure equity in the access to vaccines. So there is an interest of, of China to gain some more space in the multilateral area, specifically in the organization. Um, the, the issue is, uh, you asked if it is, uh, you know, uh, just the multilateral or the bilateral. I think they are playing, uh, there is, they are playing on, the, on both sides and for sure they're using the vaccines now, but I think it goes beyond. The problem in health, if we want really to really speak of health, is that we need China to take seriously also wider agenda which uh, of the determinants of health. You know, the environmental issues, uh, uh, the urbanization issues are all issues which are strictly related with health. So we should not think of health just in the uh, health technology or the health care services. And there we have to look at the a wider context to understand what China can really, the role that China can really play uh, for health in the global governance uh, at this stage. But I, I, I am confident that there is uh, uh, obviously the use of um, diplomacy to extend its geopolitical um, strategy. But at the same time, I think there is a the taking up of a responsibility uh, in, from the China side. I'm, I would like to be positive on this. Okay, so let's close. We are out of time. Out of time. So let's close on a positive note. So I agree with you. Uh, thanks to all the speakers, uh, Yu Kong Huang from the Carnegie in the US, Tyson Barker from the German program, uh, sorry, uh, German Council on Foreign Relations uh, in Germany, and Eduardo Missoni from Bocconi University in, uh, in Italy. Thanks to all uh, the audience and uh, best wishes to everybody and uh, see you to one of our next uh, short webinar series on China and on EU-Asia relations. <laughs>